Hello and welcome to Chair Ed TV. And today we have another special guest. And there's lots of special guests on Chair Ed TV, but Edward's a real character, unusual character, who I've known now for, gosh, must be 40 years, nearly 40 years now. And I'll tell you the story a bit later, how I first actually met him. But of course, he had this big hit with It's a Fine Day many moons ago, which, which he wrote. And again, he'll tell you a bit later about how he wrote it and the repercussions. But to say that Edward also wrote for uh, songs for 808 State and Lost Witness and some other people as well. So he's had a really good career as, as a songwriter and as an artist too. He's released several albums over the years. So we're going to talk about Edward's life and we're going to find out more about that inner Edward, so as to speak, that creative spark that comes to life and how it manifests. So Edward, you told me when we talked on the phone the other day that you, your dad was in the RAF and you travelled a lot when you were young and at one time you were actually living in Libya, weren't you? If I said that to you, I just straightforwardly lied because my father wasn't in the RAF, he was in the Royal Navy. And okay. although they share blue as a uniform, my father considered the RAF to be disgustingly faded, although one of his best friends was a bomber pilot. So perhaps he liked, uh, he liked him, but he, he could be quite dismissive about various RAF characters. Okay. Well, well, maybe that was my mistake, I don't know. But anyway, so... You travelled around a lot and you must have got to like the water because you live now in Southport, which is on the sea. And of course, you being in the Navy, your dad must have travelled and you must have lived on boats, did you, I guess, at one time? Uh, we, we went to Malaya on a boat and came back on a boat. I remember going through the Suez Canal and I remember going to Italy and being surprised how many people there were. I didn't know there were that many Italians. <laughs> I'd only got as far as Rome in my education. Okay, so just a few things from your childhood, because obviously one's childhood forms one's character, and it's always interesting to know some of the clues about how someone is the way they are. I'm looking at my notes here. And uh, when you were in Libya for a time, you got into Egyptian pop music. Is that true? Have I got that wrong as well? No, no, that's very distressingly accurate of you to know my history so intimately. <laughs> uh, we used to um, go to the bazaar uh, just for a, a look about uh, Libya, as far as my parents concerned, wasn't stuffed with recreational opportunities. So going to the bazaar was a pleasant day out. And I remember the blackness of it spotted with shining gold of all the jewellery that the Libyans favoured uh, and the music that was being broadcast from tinny transistors on every stall was Egyptian pop music. Egypt was the cultural leader of the Northern Sahara at the time. Uh, they were enthralled to uh, just all, all the beauty oh, Good Lord, I'm going to tell these. Uh... Hello, Chris. I'm afraid I'm in the middle of a chat and um, I have to ask you if I can talk to you later. Bye, Pen. I realise you don't want to edit this. I, I think perhaps you shouldn't because that was Chris, my brother, who once said to me, I wish you wouldn't write so many songs about me. So I, I think that could be seen as an opportune uh, phone call rather than an irritant. OK. So also in Libya, apparently you wrote uh, a dictionary. You told me you wrote a dictionary of swear words. Is that right? It is. I, I, I'm convinced I have it somewhere. But I have quite a good replica of it in my head. And I don't think it's all encompassing. It, it hasn't got the really proper mean swear words. 
it, it's more of a beginner's guide, a junior book of <laughs> swear words, more bum titty than the big, okay. the big short stabby Anglo-Saxon ones that used to get teachers very cross. I hadn't yet come across them. I came across the worst of them outside Croydon, sat near three bigger boys who nearly uttered no other word than one of them. And I, yeah. I had to go back to school and ask what it meant. That went down well, didn't it? I'm sure. I was told it wasn't a word I, sh I should ever use again. Yeah. Well, I lived in Croydon. I had my childhood in Croydon. Oh, so, I, so I, I did, it wasn't what, I, you're a little bit older than me. I don't think it was one of, I don't think you were one of the lads. I think I would have not recognised you. No, I kind of, uh, I got on okay with the lads, but I, I didn't kind of uh, get too involved. You know, one had to uh, somehow have that line where the lads were okay with you, but just getting too, too much in there, involved in their antics wasn't always a very good idea. Um, mm. But anyway, while in Croydon, again, you told me this, I hope I got this accurate, is that your singing was so terrible, you were asked to mime during the carol services. Yes, I think that is what they usually call a formative experience. I decided to run away from school. My parents were abroad and they sent me to live at a school in England. I didn't like it, so I decided to run away. And as I was walking through the school gates, uh, a taxi went past me and a head popped out of it and it was Mrs Gale, the gym mistress, and she said, where are you going? And I, I replied, dentist, which was the first thing I thought of. And I could have looked as if I was going to the dentist because I, was, I hadn't run away with much system or plan and wasn't carrying a bag. So off she uh, wheeled away in her taxi. And then an hour and a half later, as I was just leaving uh, urban urban life for the edge of the countryside the same taxi came back the other way and mrs gale put her head out of the window and she said what what are you what are you doing only she sounded much more cross and less curious as if convinced i was doing something i shouldn't be i couldn't think of a good lie so ran and i was halfway up quite a steep grassy hill when i looked behind me and saw that it was Mrs. Gale chasing me. Uh, was Mrs. Gale was chasing me. But she'd got an extraordinary small amount of hill behind her feet. And I had the experience of utmost contempt for her because she was the gym mistress. I was, I was absolutely disgusted that she hadn't caught me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I then walked into the woods that were at the top of the hill and continued running away. But I was already quite disgusted with her because at the carol service, um, she, yeah, she was in charge of the carol service and she had put her hand up and said, I only want half of the room to sing, the left half. And everyone on the left half, including me, sung. And then she said, I want everybody after the middle aisle on the left to sing. The others all remained quiet. And I was in that group. And we all sung. And then she said, and she pointed to a row, I want that row to sing. We all sung. Then she said, just the end of that row. And she said, Barton, you're the donkey. Could you mime, please? Henceforth, at rehearsals and at the actual carol service, could you mime, please? <laughs> well, I suppose it got you ready for Top of the Pops, didn't it? I think my whole career has been sulky attempt at retribution. So when, when did you actually start writing? I've got written down here that you started to, did write some stories at school, influenced by the Beat Generation. So were you, you writing poems then or stories then? What actually, how was the creative side of you emerging? Uh, it's not easy to answer all questions fluently. I remember writing some, f I, I think, remarkably poor poems and writing some remarkably poor pieces. I, I think it's good if you do all your bad work right at the beginning of your career. 
So, but what were your aspirations then? Did you have any aspirations about writing songs? Or I think all my aspirations and... were fairly typically teenage, which was not to feel so fucking awful all the time. Okay. So your career wasn't taking form at that stage, not uh, in an obvious my, way. My yeah. career mainly ex existed in being uh, shouted at and expelled from different schools uh, whilst trying to maintain a convincingly self-pleasing artistic, li artistic life. Uh, just typical, horrible teenage years. Any, any system where big boys are in charge of small boys. It, yeah, it's a p poor premise. So just moving on a few years, you on your website, you've got a blog, which I had a look through, which was quite quite interesting really and seems in your late teens maybe early 20s you traveled in um, in America and Canada and you, you kind of spent very little, very little money and were on uh, on on the railroad just get, get just getting on freight trains and just traveling there without paying and having all kinds of adventures yes a good way to have an ad adventures is to go somewhere far away that you can't get back from because your ticket is for six weeks or seven weeks later and to have very little money. It's almost inevitable that whether you want them or not, the adventures will encroach on your journeys. Uh, ev every day something odd happened from, I, I hitched everywhere just to sit in a car for an hour while a man boasts about atrocities that he enjoyed seeing and occasionally committing in the Second World War is something that you never forget. Every day there was something I occasionally recall with uh, shocked wonder. Well, people are strange at times and uh, nice they gave you a lift though. I, I was grateful for that, though uh, I was quite glad to have a more serene lift later in that day. So after that adventure, you came back and you were a school teacher, which I find interesting because you did. Did you have any qualifications to be a school teacher? No, I, I wasn't a school teacher. I was a putative school teacher in that uh, I, I was so tired of my dad complaining at me. I uh, enrolled on a course to become a teacher and uh, in this course, they sent you out to be a school teacher from about the third week. So I was teaching six or seven hours a day for a couple of months um, as a student teacher, uh, as an art teacher in uh, at Speak. I think it was a comprehensive, Speak Comprehensive in Liverpool, which isn't so far away from here. Uh, and I occasionally um, took football um, afternoons as well so art and football Were you a good teacher do you think? Uh, yes I, I was uh, the, the football well, they gave me um, they gave me the kids who weren't very good at football to play football with who didn't want to play football so my system was to get rid of the ball because the ball is the thing that makes football difficult. If you play football without a ball, it's really easy. What you have to do is describe what you're doing as if you had a ball and were very good at it. So uh, we enacted a play in which um, people who weren't very good at football dribbled really successfully past other people uh, and scored fantastic goals uh, with the balls that didn't exist. Um, and other people were appointed commentator and the people who the fantastic dribbler without the ball went round um, was then given a period of time in which they were a fantastic defender uh, and took the ball that the other person didn't have off them very successfully and I, I would say they were all enjoying themselves a lot they were certainly all running around and then one of the other teachers came over and was very cross because 
uh, ostensibly because we were playing football without a ball. But I think the reason he was really cross was that the people who weren't good at football were enjoying themselves but thinking they were good at football because they were very good at it because a lot of them were very imaginative, which is why they weren't good at football because it's a, a sport that in many ways limits you. And do you think their football was improving? They were having a better day than they usually had. They were the s- yeah. sort of um, chaps who, when you threw a football at them, got out of the way rather than felt the ball with a connoisseur's joy. So were you any good at football? I wasn't bad for a one-eyed footballer. <laughs> OK, and then I gather you were actually unemployed for a time. And then, I don't know if I have this in the right sequence, but then you decided you want to get on the tube and you wanted to read some of your poems or have somebody else read some of your poems on the tube. The, yeah, tube, the, being, the tube being Tony Wilson's TV programme. Yes, rather than a sort of busking outing. Yeah, just in case people don't know what the tube is. Yeah, uh, yeah so I went all the way to Newcastle and asked lots of people from Newcastle uh, to read my poems out, uh, which uh, Newcastle being a very obliging and quite um, extroverted city, it seemed to me. They were all very happy to do. But um, the tube uh, never showed them. I I rang up one day uh, and asked why it hadn't been shown after they said it was going to be shown. And they uh, blithely responded, oh, we're not doing poetry anymore. But the people that you... Because what happened was, from what I read on your blog, was that you went round Newcastle with a, a, a cameraman and... The people, you just ask random people to read your poems, which is quite a brave thing to do. And some of them really... Well, they are. Really... They're very brave, the Newcastle, Newcastle Yeah. Well, dwellers. I mean, brave, brave for you to ask them as well. And then um, they seem to quite enjoy reading your poems. But the interesting bit in the story for me was, the most interesting bit was, when you wanted to watch the next Tube programme and you didn't have a television. Just talk us through what happened there. Oh, I know. Um... Yes. Uh, My friend Mick Hobbins had a television. We didn't know anyone who had a television. These were in the days when you had to walk to a urinal just to ring your mum. Uh, Mick Hobbins had a television, went round to his house. He he said, I won't be in, but my lodger will, will let you in. She won't mind. And, yep, she's a very nice lady. She didn't mind at all. Uh, She watched it with me. She watched me not be on the tube at least three times because I went round at least three times um, on a Friday, I think it was, to to see if I was going to be on it. And after a while, she really started to share my disappointment at not being on it. Uh, And um, the the, uh, punchline is that she was Nico of the Velvet Underground. I had no idea, although I knew her work well. But she was nice to you. She was sympathetic. You got on well with her. Yes, yeah, she asked me what I did and I told her I was a songwriter and we chatted about songwriting. She said she'd done some songwriting. She underboasted, yeah. uh, it, but not not in a falsely modest way. She really didn't seem to be very, uh, to think it was very significant anything that she'd done particularly. Yeah, I, I think her main interest in life at the time was heroin. Uh, yeah. I was a, just a tiny incident. Yeah, and how, how long did it take for you to realise it was, it was Nico? Was that like weeks later, months later? or? Um, I can't remember. That's the prob- problem. I can't remember. Um, yeah. I think... I th- no, I'd, I'd be fibbing. I did keep a diary at the time, and I think that story's in there. Uh, but, I, yeah, I can't answer that question. OK. So you also tried to get on, onto the tube another time, didn't you, with Pin, your, yes. your brother, brother just, just rang up. And just talk us through how you did that, because it seems to me, again, it was a fairly uh, innovative way of trying to get on the TV. Um, 
Well, I, I thought the television would really benefit from having me pin on. And we went up to Newcastle and I th mm, knocked on the door and they foolishly invited us in. I think it was quite a junior and naive researcher. And we went up a couple of uh, ro flights of steps and we went into a big room, a lot of people in it, a lot of desks. And we were asked to show what we could do. And we did it properly. And I st stood on a desk clearing away papers and telephones with my feet to get a little space to work in and started to sing a song called Me and My Mini, which is quite a loud, boisterous, boastful, sad song. And often when I performed it live, Chris would drive around the room uh, pretending he was in a car um, looking pulling self-important faces and not obeying all of the highway code I would imagine so people had to get out of his way because he had to drive around all the desks and people heard the words of me and my mini and the accompanying guitar and afterwards they're very quiet and I thought they were awed and impressed but was wrong as proved evident when another researcher said you must be thirsty after that and took Chris and I down to the pub which was immediately opposite the front of the Tyne Tees building which they always used to show at the front of the tube uh, bought us a pint each which I thought was odd didn't think it quite consciously enough because he bought us a pint but not him one. Said he had... No, did he? Nah, that's the trouble. I, you, you, when you recollect in tranquility all those years later, some of the details uh, just, f just fade away. Did he buy a pint? Didn't he buy a pint? He certainly said he had to go to the toilet. They were his words. And he never came back. It was... Did you, did you ever get on the tube? Yes, but rather dully, as with so many things, be because of knowing somebody. Uh, a friend of mine knew a researcher on the tube, and he, my friend Alan and my friend Malcolm um, borrowed a room at the, in the cellars of the YMCA where Malcolm was the swimming instructor, and I recorded four songs, uh, which I have somewhere, and we uh, sent them to Tyne Tees, and they had a meeting. Nine people had to decide whether we should go on. Four said they didn't think it was a good idea if I went on, and five said they thought it was a good idea. So you and just made it. Yes, it was it was close. So, and then one day, I think a couple of years later, a rather nice day, we could even call it a fine day, you were standing on the balcony of where you were living and looking out, and a song unfolded, you told me earlier, in about 30 seconds. Uh, it, was the word, it was the words to the song. I was looking across to the White Horse pub and between me and it I was stood on a balcony of a block of flats or, and there was some green uh, grass is there any other color uh, yeah there was grass and paths and a few people and I just wrote it down it didn't take very long um, what is it it's probably only a, a, about 12 short sentences I just wrote it down as it happened the only difference is that the very first line was, it's a nice day, not it's a fine day. Um, shut, shut the little book I was writing in, thought about something else. And then sometime later, decided I'd write a song. I'd not written a song before. Uh, open, or did I look at, possibly, I, l I looked at the words later and thought I could write a song. 
anyway, it's certainly the first song I ever wrote. And I sung the words into a cassette machine. So one of the sweet things about that song is if the words took 25 seconds to write and the tune took as long to write as it did to sing because I was happy with the first version, with the first tune I thought of. Um, yeah, if the song takes longer to sing than it did to write. Well, it's extraordinary. That was the first song you wrote. And then you had the idea of making it an a cappella version. And you, so. I didn't I really have any choice. I didn't know any musicians. <laughs> and so, and how did you find Jane who sang it? I, first of all, I went round to see my friend Louise and asked her to sing it. And when I first put the single out, it had Jane on one side and Louise on the other side. Um, L Louise was very brave and nice, and she sung it as a favour, although she didn't like her own voice, and didn't consider it worthwhile, and was surprised that I wanted to put it on the record, um, and said, really, I should find someone who could sing. So I took her advice, and not knowing anyone other than Louise who could even try to sing. Uh, I asked my friend Mike, who I lived with, if he knew anyone who could sing. And he said he knew someone who might know someone who could sing, who was a musician called Gabriel. I found Gabriel and I asked him if he knew anyone who could sing. And he said he didn't and wasn't very interested. And I forgot got about him for a while and did some pondering but before I'd finished pondering Gabriel approached me and said he did know someone who could sing and I was surprised that he'd uh, changed his mind because he'd seemed so monumentally indifferent to my initial request. I discovered later that the, re the reason he was more enthusiastic the second time was he'd met a girl who could sing who he wanted to kiss and he needed something to talk about to her so he could approach her sideways as it were asking her if she could sing he'd heard that she could and he knew this chap who needed somebody to sing and was she interested and she was interested not because she wanted to sing a song but because she was as gabriel hoped smitten by gabriel oh, wonderful and <laughs> i think they were together for quite a long time and uh, she did the singing, uh, I think partly because it was part of her nice moment. Well, that's a very sweet story, very sweet. And you took the initiative... Gabriel get... ended up playing piano on the record. OK. And you had the initiative to actually press up copies of the record and send it to a few, a few disc jockeys, including John Peel. I think I only sent it to John Peel. OK. And as you know, but people watching this won't know, what happened was that I, one night, I was having dinner with uh, the German licensee at the time of Cherry Red. And I got back to my car and I was driving home on the West Way in London. And I suddenly found I had two flat tyres. And of course, those days there wasn't mobile phones. So you had to go and find a phone. It was about 11.30 at night. It was quite late. And so I eventually got hold of the rescue service, AA, explained my predicament. They said they'd send somebody out. And I went and sat in my car. And I switched on the John Peel show, which was from 10 till midnight in those days. And the first song I heard was It's a Fine Day. And I thought, I really like that song. It's a great song. So the next day... I called John Walters, who I knew, who was the producer of the John Peel show. And I said, that song you played last night, it's a fine day. Tell me about it. He just said, oh, we got this. John got one in the post. John Peel got one in the post. And he gave me your phone number. And I rang you up. And we did a deal, didn't we, for Trey Red to take on the, uh, the record and the song. And we put it out on Trey Red, 
and he got quite a lot of airplay. And I think we both hoped it would be a hit, but it wasn't actually a hit. Although you believed it was a hit, didn't you? Uh, I think there was a, a gap between it being played on the radio and the pressing being available. I think it was played a lot on the radio, and then by the time the pressing was available, the radio player died off. But I'm quite glad it wasn't a hit. I, I didn't really know how to write songs. It would have been... A, but you must have sent him something to play, so you sent him a test pressing, did you? He, I put out, I put it, what, what happened? I just, I just sent him a copy of it. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, well, with that, Louise singing on one side and Jane singing on the yeah. other side. And you, uh, that was it. You chaps said we need a proper B-side. Uh, and Jane was quite busy, couldn't do anything for three weeks. So it took three weeks for her to sing the B-side and then get it pressed up. And uh, it had, had the crescendo had started to diminish. Yeah, well, yeah, we got some airplay. It wasn't a hit, but you believed that in that song, didn't you? I believe in what, whatever I'm doing. Uh, you, you've got to have confidence to do anything. Yeah. And then several years later, um, I was at Medem. And Medem is the, people, for people who don't know, is the, is, is the convention that happens once a year uh, where music business people go down to Cannes, the south of France, and they meet other people, have meetings, and, uh, and maybe do deals, but make new contacts, whatever. And I was having dinner one night, and then Pete Waterman, who was then a very successful producer uh, from uh, PWL, he came up to me, he said, Ian, we're going to have a number one hit with your song. I didn't even know which song he meant at the time until I said, which, which song, Pete, are you talking about? He said, it's a fine day. And a group called Opus 3 did a cover version. It wasn't number one, but it was a hit all over Europe. So that must have... Were you surprised when that happened, or was that kind of something you thought should happen in time? I th uh, what was, was an American... Is she American or Canadian? No, singer-songwriter. No, singer-songwriter. Um, Joe's... Tom's Diner. Uh... I forget the, the lady's name. Oh, Daisy's just called through. Suzanne Vega. Um, one of her tunes was uh, set, as it were, to music, to beats, um, fairly successfully. And I thought, okay. I thought that aroused the possibility in me that It's a Fine Day okay. was a candidate for similar treatment. Yeah. And I thought... My thoughts really were, well, if anyone does it, I hope they do a decent job because I fully expected someone to do it at some point. And I, I got a phone call from the chap who had recorded It's a Fine Day on Blossom Street in North Manchester. Um, who uh, I think it cost £4 to record. Uh, and he said, it cost oh, you £4 to record the original version? Mm, yeah, it's four wow. quid. Uh, plus plus possibly the cost of the tape. But he he really c couldn't be asked to do it. He just fitted it in between something else. And he, he was quite curmudgeonly throughout the whole process. Um, and years later, he did say, I wish I'd spent a little bit more time on that recording. I, yeah. I said, uh, but uh, he rang me up and said, put the telly on. And uh, I don't know if I had a telly. But somehow I, 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 I heard it, it being uh, performed on a programme called Hitman and Her. So anyway, it got to number five in the UK. It was a hit all over Europe. And obviously you made a bit of money out of that, which was nice. Then you had a bigger surprise, didn't you, a few years later when you heard on the radio a song by Carly McNogue? Yes, uh, why did I? Ah, uh, oh yes, I told you that story, didn't I? Um, woke up one afternoon, or was woken rather, by my radio alarm. And I thought, that's a nice tune to greet the day with. 
and then my next thought after that thought was that's my tune that's a nice tune that's my tune and it was confided in me by Kylie uh, with the, the strings where it's a fine day so the two guys who wrote that song had either well, I presume one has to assume they didn't do it on purpose, but they'd obviously heard It's a Fine Day and used part of the melody in the song, and you ended up with a share of the song, didn't you? Yeah, as, as is right and fair. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you, now you seem very cool about the whole thing, but wasn't it quite extraordinary, really, that you'd end up with part of a Carly McNose song? Uh, yes, it, yeah, it's, it's good. But my little top ten of my favourite moments are obscure ones nobody's ever heard, some of which have never been re released. Uh, so I'm not s proud of it in, in any odd, huge way. I'm glad it happened. Uh, I'm just much more interested in the music I made yesterday or will make tonight it's it's pleasing but the glow wears off but it bought you a house yeah all the all these things are good but I take them for granted yeah okay they're, they're, you, you, some good things happen in life some bad things happen yeah that 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 was a good one I don't mean to play it down I'm very pleased it happened, but I don't dwell on it. I just make more music, paint more pictures. Yeah, so anyway, that encouraged you to... You started your own little label, didn't you? Wooden Records, where you put out some releases, including an album with lots of people recording your songs. Uh, yeah, I was utterly convinced I was wonderful in in my 20s in fact, in fact that's not quite fair i mean nasty to young edward i don't i was completely convinced i wasn't wonderful but i was completely convinced i could write wonderful songs i was firmly committed to changing music completely so that te a few years after i'd released all these new songs music would be utterly different. Obviously, I was bonkers. Well, not necessarily bonkers. You were just maybe a tad over-optimistic. No, I lived in my own little world uh, yeah, but and imagined I could alter the world outside it. Yeah, but that's what, that's what makes you so original and, and often really creative people with... with great ideas often do that it's the way it is and, um, I probably would have ruined music if it had been successful so the world's very lucky <laughs> anyway so wooden records kind of I know there was one album you put out where you've got all kinds of people to, to record your songs I have a list here In Spiral Carpet 808 State Ted Chippingham Louis Philippe a guy called Gerald so you've got some people with a bit of a name on there who uh, must have liked the song enough to, to record it for you uh, Ma Manchester in that period um, was just I'd, I'd met some musicians I started with Gabriel and I met some more musicians um, they seemed quite happy to cover the songs it, it made the world less lonely having people to have fun with and then you went on to uh, you had some uh you had some hits, didn't you, with, with for Lost Witness, where you wrote the ly lyrics? Uh, trance music. I'm fascinated by trance music. It tries to achieve maximum effect from the simplest and tritest of inform of product. Uh, I, yeah, I, you, I'm, you're gonna get. I'm just gonna make noises now and go blimey, and I don't know for for a bit because I've there were a couple of years where I just produced trance lyrics and tunes, um, 
and it seemed it seemed seemed to work. Uh, I, I often think that if you want to write a trance tune, it's it's quite e it's quite easy. Um, think of an emotion, Ian. Give me an emotion, but we'll have a positive one rather than a negative one, please. Joy. 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 Um, right. Think of some weather. A beautiful day, about twenty-three degrees. Degrees, perfect for a walk. That, oh, I like the side. detail. I like the detail. <laughs> joy. <laughs> So you sing joy for about half an hour, just like that. The one note will do. Joy, it's a beautiful day. Joy. Off you started. Um, well, I, I want to co-write on this if it's a hit. You're not getting anything. <laughs> but, but yeah, if you've got jo joy in a beautiful day, joy, joy on a beautiful day, to try and think of something good, then forget it and think of something much worse, such as everything's coming my way. Joy, it's a beautiful day. Everything's coming my way. Bit, little bit too much early 70s soft rock in that, but I, I can work on it. So, yeah, trance songs. Think of a, a, an emotion that isn't too miserable and think yeah. of some weather. So what you're saying is quite, it was quite easy to do that. Um, no, I, I had to look at a lot of Athena posters in my mind. Okay. So I'm just running through your career and picking out interesting things so people get a feel of what the real Edward Barton's like in terms of his creativity. And you also, you supported uh, James, who slept in a van, and you also supported Micro Dizzy and, and Stump. So you were kind of, you were a working musician as well in terms of doing live shows. Uh, yes, they're very nice to take me on their musical holidays with them. Yeah, I, I enjoyed those trips. I, they did often result in boils because you, I'd have to sleep in vans and it'd get hot and I didn't, I wasn't able to wash and the food was appalling. Worst food ever. Lead Mill Sheffield. That, that I'm frankly odd to even call it food. And yes, I was sacrificed earlier on in the evening before the main act came on. You know, it's interesting that that there was there's a documentary that uh, you know Dave Grohl. Um, he he's done some documentaries, and his latest one, I forget the title of it, but it's it's about the early days of bands who became huge. <coughs> being on the road and just traveling in the van, mainly many American bands. And you realize how hard some of these bands worked. And it's like, in the old days, it wasn't like someone became famous in a few months, like people try and do now. They work for years and on, on these long, long tours, often playing in not very great places. It was an office job at night. You were doing an office in job In a van. At well, it was. It was yeah. And then you got more involved with James and, he, and, he, and even, I think, directed their first or produced their first video for, for um, Sit Down. Is that right? Yes, that, that was another pleasant day out. Um, I more, more or less uh, embroiled my whole family in making that video. The dogs are my sister's and the sheep belong to my sister. Uh, she stole it from a Pennine Hillstead. And I came home one day to my flat, and there was a sheep in it. Um, I was the surprised. Sheep was, in, was in your flat. Mm, mm. She got. She was with my mother uh, at the chemist, trying to find a, a bottle that they could use to put milk in to try and feed the sheep. And while they were out, I came home, and yes, there was a a, a lamb, a lamb okay. in, in my flat, uh, but. Not that different from the time I came home and my mother had stolen somebody's somebody's cr crow. Um, so I was prepared to find animals in the house. I readjust quickly. But, you know, I wanted just to kind of acknowledge your initiative in so far as you produce a video and the, the song becomes a big hit and uh, you had a cameo in the video and as you say, you organised the props, the dogs, etc., the sheep. Um, it's, 
give yourself some credit for that. Uh, yeah, all right. Well done, Edward. <laughs> exactly. Well done. Well done, you clever lad. Yeah, but no, it was a very, very pleasant day. You have some ideas. Um, you take them for a walk. Leave the bad ones outside. Bring the good ones home. Um, ask other people if they're prepared to go along with those ideas. They say yes or no. For instance, I, I said to Chris, I had an idea at the as we were making the video. I said, Chris, could you find me about 11 or 12 old chaps to put in this video and he said oh said, yeah okay and he he went out he went to the sally army uh no first he went to the off license bought quite a lot of beer went to the sally army um said he'd swap beer for work they turned up sat on some chairs drank the beer talked to each other talked to us we're in the video so it was just a lot of lot of people um, helping the video. Yeah, but you know, it, it's an art to hold the whole thing together, have an overview, isn't there? And kind of make sure it works. It's one thing having original ideas. It's another thing making that. It's fast, it's fast seeing. I think I'm, I'm all right at that, fast seeing. Yeah, because creativity has to have form. If it doesn't have form, it doesn't go anywhere, basically. And then also in the 2000s, you, you, did a, you had a performance night in Manchester called Misery. Well, why did you call it Misery? Um, this is pretty much the worst period of my life. Uh, misery was a looming word at the time. So uh, it seemed thoroughly appropriate. So, um, and why were you unhappy then? I think it's good to have an unhappy period. Um, I, was, I was probably unhappy because it was good for me. Learn a lot of <laughs> lessons when you're unhappy. Okay. So, very useful. If you're happy all your life, you've made a mistake. Because you haven't got a perspective, have you? That's exactly it. You're right. Well, one way to look at it anyway. And then you, one of the things you did was you put out you sent me one at the time. You sent me this box. Oh, Remember yes. This? Yes, yes. And open the box. It's called Unboxing. Now it's got mm. a term. And we have here Edward Barton, traditional bear on the front, and a panda. And we've got in there a great little lyric book, all written out by you. We've got a picture of someone that looks a bit like your younger brother. <laughs> there he is. There he is. And it's just, you know, very creative. Ah, uh, yes. And, uh, yeah, lot, lots of nice artwork in there, etc. And I just thought, because this was a bit ahead of its time, you know. These days, yes, especially with reissues, you have these boxes with... Um, full of CDs and different versions and demos and live versions but here you were doing a box before other people did a box and you wrote me a nice note you said dear Ian hour I'm done eventually and now as promised posted blimey Edward <laughs> yep it's nearly <laughs> so a haiku it isn't it I kept it all so just shows that you kept going musically and I know that you you write these days for a little group called Haim H -A -I Ham H -A -I -M. yeah short for Hannah yeah okay yeah and you told me when we talked on the phone that you to do that you had to put your mind into the mind of a 20 year old girl yes I don't know I don't know how successfully I I am how successfully I do it um Hannah uh, must think the, my um, what would you what would you call it? Uh, I'm going to spend half an hour thinking of this word now. Don't worry. I'm Don't going worry. to pretend Keep I've going. said the word. My well, whatever the word is is successful um, because she's happy to sing them. 
But it's like it's interesting because you told me when we talked again recently, you before that the the songs tended to be personal. You'd write about things in, that happened to you. In, or things in my twenties, I yeah. thought what happened to me was important. Gradually, I've, as I've got older, I've realised that I need to di dilute that by the amount of people there are in the world. Uh, so I don't write about myself much. I find other people far more interesting. I, I've worn myself, my interest in myself is quite worn out. I vaguely acknowledge m my own existence a couple of times a day during meals. <laughs> And you also said to me at one point that you you wanted to have less thoughts. You thought one thought an hour was probably the optimum for you. Yeah, that's that's overwhelming enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem with doing things things like this. Uh, it's there's too many thoughts. There's too many collisions of m memories and uh, semi-forgotten events. They all come crashing into each other uh, I feel as if I, I'm trying to catch plates that are, are falling out of an awkward sideboard and you now you now live you just bought I think you bought it anyway a hotel in Southport with 12 rooms uh, 13 toilets 13 I, toilets I, yeah, I wanted to plan for old age I think <laughs> in extreme age a toilet in every room is a is a necessary. And what you've also done, which in a way has prompted this uh, interview, is you have reunited with Jane, you have 11 new songs, and you have a new album out in Cherry Red called Two, which is, uh, I love, as you know, I've played it so many times, and uh, uh, it's just, for, for me, very unique, and it, carries on the spirit of it's a fine day somehow but kind of it's what you see in the world now so do you want to say anything briefly about the album if you're writing songs for someone else to sing you're trying to make the uh, the person who's singing them happy so i had I make I make music and if I make a pretty tune I put it in the Jane pile if I make a a, a sour or a frenetic or some other adjective that all those other adjectives that isn't aren't sweet I keep it for myself so I, I gradually increase the pile of sweet tunes uh, for Jane um, when we had enough, 11 or 12 sweet tunes, we had a record. And how easy is it, is it for you to write a song these days? Uh, I don't like to waste time, so I, I write them as quickly as I can, which means most of them are usually quite quick. Uh, occasionally one will, one will fight back. But I spend a lot of time on the lyrics and hardly any time at all on the tunes. And that seems to work best. So I tend to use the first tune I think of and the last lyric. And when I say I use the last lyric, quite often the line that started the song that you thought would make a good song isn't even in it anymore. Yeah, and you have, I'm just looking at the titles now, the songs, it's kind of Give Your Mum a Kiss. Then we've got He's Not Asked, Dance Around the Lake, Shushy Time, Walking Back from Town, and you've just got, and everyone tells a story, every song, and you don't get that so much these days, and you know, in, in modern music, you get kind of constructed songs, algorithm type, formal type songs, but with you, every song tells a little story, often a very sweet story. I listened to lots of uh, folk music and blues in the 70s and 80s and I like stories that relay events. I, I don't like um, 
I'm just going to shut this door in. Wait a minute. Uh, Daisy's washing up like, or putting cut crockery away. I can't hear it. Wait a moment. I really like kitchen noises. Uh, I've got a, a habit when I'm washing up and putting things away of every time you hear a noise of repeating the noise. And uh, I was starting to, you were starting to have competition there. <laughs> I was starting to listen to the crockery noise thinking, oh, I like the way that went. Yeah. So, and how long did it take you to write the songs for the album? Uh, I write them constantly, so days sometimes. Sometimes yeah. so, some lines you could almost measure them in miles, because I I've got a small dog called Percy, and I have to walk him, and that's always a really good opportunity to fix to fix a line, and if I'm his legs are in danger of erosion if I if I'm having trouble finding the line I'll just keep slowly going until I get it so that's your inspiration is walking with Percy and then it, it's somehow. more it's it's not the inspiration it's it it's it's the massage <laughs> the massage provides the message Okay, getting it into a form somehow that's tangible. The, the, uh, yeah, the the rhythm just... If, if you're... Quite often, if you're stuck, change what you're physically doing. is, And then your mind changes too. Yeah. And and how easily does the music come together? Uh, it's, it, that's, that's a strange one as well, because... I don't think of it as easy as hard. I think it, of it as enjoyable or obstreperous. Sometimes it can t take a really long, long time, but the the, pro the process is in enjoyable and and, yeah. and please and pleasing. Uh, just just making mistake after mistake after mistake is strangely enjoyable so how's this album going to do because you you had the feeling with it's a fine day it would eventually be a hit and you were right so how's the album two going to do do you think um oh i i don't know i uh, jane likes it that makes me happy i th i think there's songs on there that people would enjoy if they got to hear them. But there's a lot of music in this world at the moment, isn't there? It's quite easy to make music. There's lots of it about. Uh, but the interesting thing is that people only have so many hours in the day. And that doesn't change. So people can only listen to a finite amount. It would be good as... If, as there was more music, we had more time in which to listen to it. Yeah, that's something you can maybe work on. What do you think? Um, yeah, I, I, eternal life. Well, more hours in the day, yeah. 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 You know, and you're right, because in terms of number of songs, because I don't know if you know this figure, but every day, every day, 60,000 plus new songs get put up on Spotify. Plus, every day there's even more old songs. Well, I mean, I mean that when 60,000 new songs, I mean songs that weren't on Spotify, so they may be old songs, yeah. Yes. So no, no, what I meant by that was the amount of recorded music in increases. Yes, that's true. Plus all the old ones that are already there, yeah. Mm. Okay, Edward, we're going to finish now. I'm going to plug again the new album. To Jane and Barton. Thank you for talking with me. It's been a bit of an off-the-wall interview, but I like the interruptions with uh, 
the dog and Daisy and all the rest of it. So it's the way it is. Ah, oh, well, good. I'm glad. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad. Good. And thank you, everyone out there, for watching uh, Cherry Red TV and listening to the quite extraordinary, really, Edward Barton. Rest your arms on your desk Rest your head on your arms Rest your eyelashes On your cheeks Think of less and 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 let the darkness make you calm. It's shushy, shushy, shushy time. It's shushy, shushy, shushy time. It's a little night time in the day. It's a little night time in the day. Listen to your breath To the beat of your heart To the day outside This class Birds, the weather, streets and cars And cars And far away the sky, the stars It's shushy, shushy, shushy time it's shushy, shushy, shushy time. It's a little night time in the day. It's a 